All right, Adam, how is my millennial podcast quality? Are you, you got, any millennial would be proud of you. Any millennial. Actually, that's actually no millennial would be proud of me. My kids mm. would just roast me. <laughs> only, only my fellow Xers. That's the only place I can find out. <laughs> uh, I was so I, I. This is just a bridge too far, and I apologize. And I, I know I can get this working if I have a little more time. But I was really just trying to get my audio to work through my <laughs> terrific new framework laptop. Oh no! <laughs> no, but it's not, it's not framework. It is, it, it, this is so far ahead of where we are with the Dell. I cannot even. Okay. Begin to tell you, this is basically going to be a therapy session for me where I, <laughs> I I unload on this goddamn Dell that has more or less ruined my life. So, no, this framework's already way, way ahead, and I know I can get this working. I just, I just, just, just ran out of time. So, I'm sorry about that. Glad to hear that. We oh. can make this a live debug session, too, if you want to go. There. That's right. <laughs> we, for the we first. Can. No, you, I mean, it literally, <laughs> I mean, this is. I, I literally just got this. So I actually, and Adam, did, did you describe our story with respect to to framework? No, let's uh, let, let's like you know start at the top or whatever. Yeah, start at the top. Whatever, get, get, get. whatever that whatever that story is sounds good. Yeah, well, I feel like I, I mean, well, what's uh, do you want to in, intro Narav? Have you already done that? Or are we? No, but no. I mean, I was waiting. I mean, not to stand on ceremony, but I was kind of waiting on you. <laughs> that makes sense. Waiting on me to yeah. debug my laptop issues. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, Narav, welcome. Uh, it is great to to have you here. Great to um, be here. We are uh, really big fans of a framework. Uh, so, Adam has been Adam. You've been a, you've been like an original stan, I would say, a framework. You, I think you were. I think that's fair to say. So, our colleague Aryan, I guess you guys work together in, yeah, Oculus. in Oculus. Is that right, Narav? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right when I th I think right when you were announcing a product, Aryan sent it over to me and. I'm a little embarrassed that I impulse bought a laptop, but that's sort of what happened. I was so excited about what you guys were doing that I put my name on the list. Um, and, you know, it took a little while to get here, but it was awesome. And I put it together with my, uh, with my teenage son. We had a great time. And then uh, I pretty much never saw it again. Like he absconded with it <laughs> almost immediately. And he has reinstalled Linux on it like 15,000 times um, and loves the thing. And, and I get to use it every once in a while. But yeah, oh, I'm a huge fan of what you guys are building. Um, like a a you know from scratch, I think uh, implementation, consumer electronics, but all serviceable and you know uh, you can poke around inside, build it yourself. It was awesome, an awesome experience building it. I love to hear that. I love the building it with your kid story as well. Oh, that like, is it, great. <laughs> yeah, just the, the depressing world we would all live in if. Every child was using a MacBook, and none of you know, no one was growing up with that experience of taking apart their parents' computers and hoping this still worked afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I wish I could, I, I, I could give you another heartwarming story of assembling a framework laptop with my own children, but sadly, uh, that, that's, uh, um, well, Adam knows my kids, so that's my, my, my kids are much more into the destroying thing. Well, as they, you, yeah. when you, when you unwrapped it, Brian, you were excited to do it with with your kids, but I guess I that might have been a one sided excitement. I, I could not. You know, my daughter was out. I would have been able to. I, I think uh, she would have been into it. Um, I, I've got a an eleven year old daughter. She would have been into it. The nineteen year old and the sixteen year old. If, if I could have somehow told them that, like, if we, I have changed the Wi Fi password, and the only <laughs> way to get the new Wi Fi password is to assemble this laptop with me. I think they still would have been like, no, 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 we're just going to torture you. You're going to give us the Wi-Fi password. I just, I don't, I think they still wouldn't have gone for it. But um, no, it was uh, so. And, and Adam, you had ordered a, a a framework, and actually, perhaps unbeknownst to you, I had actually also mm. ordered a framework. Um, at the um, so Narav, you uh, one of your engineers gave a presentation at the open source firmware conference. Yes, Daniel, and um, which was awesome. Um, and on the, some of the Rust-based firmware that I think you, that you have in development. And I, I swear that whole conference like went to the website and started ordering one, started <laughs> configuring one. Uh, and I was trying to figure out if I wanted the, 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 the 13 or the 16. And I'm in a, I'm in a very bad relationship. It wasn't a bad relationship. I'd like to say with a, uh, I had a, so Drav, uh, you might, may I give you my own personal laptop yeah, journey for a moment? It. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, it, it, it ends with a. Uh, the good news of my framework, my new framework laptop. But the I had a so I was a little embarrassed actually that when we started the company, 
But when did you all start at Framework? It must have been 2020, maybe? January 2020, that's right. That makes me feel so much better because we started the company in 2019. And I'm like, I need to buy a laptop. I'm going to buy a Dell. I'm like, I'm sitting here roasting Dell in this pitch deck. And I basically got to sit here and buy a Dell, which I felt right. bad about. So uh, the, and, and because you did, I, um, I think I also, and I look system 76 also, I kind of looked at, I, 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 they were also at the open source firmware conference, but um, I would have loved to have not gotten a Dell, but I got a Dell and then kind of even worse. Like it was actually the XPS 13 and it was actually okay. Uh, I, I kind of liked it and felt dirty about it. And then the wheels started kind of falling off the thing. And Adam, did you see when the, the batteries got real bloated on that thing? Did you, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, that, that was very exciting. Yeah. I didn't quite realize how exciting that was. So <laughs> I, you know, one of the double E's is like, God, what's going on? Like, why is your laptop kind of like rocking on the desk? I'm like, I, I don't know. That's a, I, you know, I probably haven't treated it very well. And then someone else is like, is it looks like your keyboard is like distended a little bit. And finally, someone was like, I think you're, you need to look at your batteries. I think yeah, it was Nathaniel. Who, who I, oh, no, it was like an intervention of like, yeah. this thing's unsafe. And uh, I think, or maybe it was Matt Keeter. It was like, you need to go to the Spicy Pillows Reddit. <laughs> Have you ever been to the Spicy Pillows Reddit, Adam? Never. Okay, so a Spicy Pillow is one of these batteries that has become distended. And it is a, and Rob, I'm sure you know all the physics involved, oh, yeah. but it is... It's a fire risk. Um, and so we, I went to the Spicy Pillows Reddit, which has all of these kind of bloated batteries. And I realized that the battery that I had was not just considered to be like a spicy pillow or an extra spicy pillow, but it was like ghost pepper spicy pillow. I literally like, I did not, the thing was outside on a cookie sheet that night because I was so scared it was going to burn. I mean, I've been sleeping with this laptop more or less. Anyway. <laughs> Under your pillow. <laughs> The, the, the literally is my pillow. So the the and but you know the, the, but no, to kind of like the the kind of the, the part of the core of framework. It's like this laptop was basically functional, and little things started breaking that I wanted to replace. And in particular, one of the keys broke, and I'm like, you know, I'm gonna do like a, I, I'm gonna like do the right thing and actually go buy a replacement key. And I bought six different replacement keys for that thing that were supposed to be the exact model number. And they didn't, they were like slightly wrong. And right. you know, you're not buying like Dell is not supporting you trying to go do that. I mean, I replaced the battery. And so I'm like, I'm kind of like proud of myself for barely keeping this thing together, but I can't replace this key. I, the laptop I, I, I have to interject just because it was so oh. delightful. The months when you couldn't type an E, I just really enjoyed those months. <laughs> okay. Look, it was never it's quite that sad. bad. I, I mean, yeah, like yeah. you know, keyboards what like two or three percent of the bomb value of that laptop. The batteries, you know, maybe five percent of the bomb value. But any one of those things breaking forces you to have to go to extreme measures if you can't repair it. Go to extreme measures if you can't repair it. Yeah. So I and I was really again frustrated because I was trying to repair this so many different times, and like I'm I'm buying what should be the exact key, and it's just like subtly wrong. And of course, like Dell is doing the thing that always happens, where you're getting like they will subtly change the bomb without changing any, and we've obviously seen this on the server side where this stuff changes without changing the actual SKU or model number. So actually there are like 18 of these that were made and that have the same model number and you're not going to, you're not finding the right part. So it's like, ah, oh, so frustrating. That's right. Yeah. And there's no incentive for cross compatibility because really it's only for their own internal service purposes. Totally. And their view of course is like, well, if it, if you know if the T key breaks, you should just buy. Oh, also, Adam, it was the T key, not the oh, it was the T key. It was the T key because of all. I remember, <laughs> right? Because you would explain about the T key and I like T key torch, T key bar. What are we talking about? Right. There's a lot of like threes company antics around here. I know that's referenced I, that I'm, I can no longer make talk about like <laughs> you know, millennials. It's very blanket, but like people are just like the T, like a T key lounge. No, like a T key, like a T key. I'm like, no, a T. <laughs> Pause, 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 pause. Key, K E Y. Like, oh, your key. <laughs> I'm like, yes. Um, the oh. yeah, it was it, it it was it was bad. But then and then that laptop, like, this is kind of like this jalopy that is still making. Like, I can still, you know, not totally hate my life with that thing gets stolen. And I'm like, what the thief? What was actually stolen from me was actually <laughs> a like working UDEV rules. That is what those thieves stole from me, and it is priceless. Like was it still working with the spicy UDEV pillow? rules and a working Wi-Fi config. 
and working audio. <laughs> and so Wait, I bought a, repl- a replacement XPS 13, and it is so enragingly bad. I mean, that, that product has just gone absolutely into the ditch and everything about it is awful first of all adam you know like when you got like like the escape key is hooked up to like razor blades and voltage you know what i mean when the the escape (laughs) key is like they're clearly like okay i get it like you're you're an emacs person whoever designed this keyboard like like a dog bites me whenever i hit escape like okay okay um but it was and everything about that computer is awful and the keyboard's awful. The touchpad is awful. The touchpad also like seizes up where, you know, because they, they want to be able to use the touchpad as, as the mouse. And the thing just like, it's like, you know what? I'm no longer a mouse. I just like, and it, it kind of like freezes for seconds at a time. And the worst thing is, and I'm sorry, we're going to be done with this therapy session really shortly, but my audio was working on that thing. And it then stopped working. And it was a real, I mean, it's such a hassle because I, you can see other people have the same problem. I can go Google my problem and I, you know, I'm going in the D message and I can see that the, that the, the, the kernel driver is tossing and I'm trying to update my kernel. I'm trying to do all the kinds of the things that you do. And I just cannot get the audio working again. And you get to the point where like, I can spend the rest of my life getting this audio working. And it's, you know, everyone's Adam's roasting me. Everyone's roasting me on the, you know, it's just like, this is awful. Um, and of course, it's like it's really bad. Like you're a computer company, you can't get your audio working. I'm like, it's not. <sighs> so anyway, when do, when the I saw the framework presentation, I'm like, I'm buying a framework right now. And then Adam, you were like, hey, you know what? I've got this framework that like we have got this extra machine that I basically have. Well, basically, I had gotten in line for the 13, and then got in line for the 16 inch, but forgotten to take myself out of line. So <laughs> was able to pass that off. Glad that worked. Yeah, exactly. it did. Well, it definitely works. So then, and then the thirteen that I had ordered at o, at OSFC arrived basically at the same time. So we have got <laughs> a, we've got a thirteen that's kicking around an oxide thirteen. So Bonus. we're going to nice. Yeah, we, we're, we're, some other lucky oxide engineer is going to get into framework. Anyway, no, I finally assembled this thing over the weekend, and uh, it was great. I absolutely loved it. It was so much fun. Um, and I, 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 I uh, I'm sorry that I tried to fly too close to the sun and get the. <laughs> The fancy audio working on it. I know I can. I just I just couldn't quite in time. But um, you've got a really uh, great product here, and it was just exciting to go. Uh, I, I and I, I love so much about this. So I got a lot of questions for you. Um, All right. Yeah. Um, one is so I love the um the the orientation around community because I will tell you that one of the most frustrating things. It's always frustrating when you feel like you spent a lot of money on something and you've got a problem and you're kind of being blamed for the problem that you've got. And I love the orientation around community and allowing people to like comment on their experience on your, you know, as people are kind of going through the steps to configure your laptop, they can see the experience of others. That it feels like community is a really important part of of the the origin story of framework. But I'd love I'd love to hear what that origin story actually is. Yeah, it's true. No, I mean, the whole philosophy is that it's your product and you can do what you want with it. And so the community is just this incredibly powerful aspect of the whole thing. And really from the start, you know, the part of making this product modular and upgradable and repairable was opening up enough of it that we could actually get the community developing their own compatible parts or coming up with their own fixes or, you know, coming up with their own recipes for things that we would just never be able to do on our own. And, and, you know, of course, uh, you know, Adam and Brian coming from the software world, you know, you know that this is incredibly common in software to develop an ecosystem around a set of open source software and have the, you know, the power of the community become this multiplying factor. Uh, and it really ends up being pretty magical for everyone. And in hardware, that's mostly absent. And it's, you know, pretty unfortunate that it's mostly absent. And so with framework, I really looked at that and thought like, you know, we can actually do something really cool here. Um, And just, you know, concrete stuff, if you look at the expansion card system. So for folks who are not familiar, expansion cards are these little modules that you can slot in to choose the ports on your framework laptop. Right from the beginning, we published a bunch of CAD reference design specs up on GitHub. And then almost immediately, we saw people in the community building their own cards. And there were things that we had never even thought of, let alone, you know, had the, the bandwidth to go and build ourselves. And the really exciting stuff starts to happen as... We build enough of an install base ourselves that these people creating their own modules can actually start to build businesses against that, which, of course, is 
a win for everyone. You know, it's a win for our, us as a company, of course, but really, more, more importantly, it's a win for the community and the end users of the product who are getting this really great ecosystem built around the product that they're using. That was no, feels, so, that feels so great. Yes, yeah, right, Adam, go ahead. Oh, no, I just got to say the, the expansion card uh, was one of the things that really got me hooked initially. Just so um, representative of the different philosophy that you were taking, you know, opening things up, inviting developers in, uh, inviting, you know, I had no idea what might go into that slot, but the idea that you were open to it was, was such a breath of fresh air compared with, you know, all of these extremely closed in ecosystems. I thought that was great. Right. And it, it's just, that's a very obvious thing in retrospective. Like, you know, everyone's got different ports that they need. And, you you know, if you look at laptop reviews or community comments from like, you know, 2005 through 2019, like half the reviews out there call out is a negative, not enough ports or doesn't have the right ports. And so for us, looking at building a new laptop from scratch and thinking about like, okay, how do we set ourselves apart? One very obvious thing was, why don't we just let people choose the ports they want? We're never going to be able to get it right on our own. Yeah, that is all. I love it. I And I love it because I think I've got, I mean, I think er, many developers have got idiosyncratic port needs. Uh, one of the things, you know, developing a microcontroller software firmware, uh, like USB-A ports are actually super convenient. Um, so, and laptops don't generally have them. So generally you're having to go through a hub if you want to get in any USB-A. So it's, uh, I um, for the four that I picked, I definitely, one of mine was USB-A. I am, I am a little curious if I can ask you a technical question. The, apparently if the USB-A, uh, if the USB-A expander is in the rear, it draws more power. Is this that... is, that's correct, actually. Unfortunately, this is actually an artifact of the retimers that are in uh, the AMD system specifically. So we use these oh, retimers from a, a startup called CanDo that's based, uh, I think they're headquartered in the Bay Area. Um, it's a really great part. Like this really excellent, you know, USB 4 retimer that's, um, you know, it's pretty compact package and it's you know, relatively power efficient. But it makes the assumption that there's going to be a device on the other end, a USB 3 device on the other end that can negotiate going into the low power USB states like the U2 or the U3 states. But if you have, you know, the termination resistor for a USB A port there, but no device telling it, hey, I'm ready to go into U2 or U3, the retimer just stays and waits for a device to show up. Um, which is pretty unfortunate. Uh, and so we do basically just share some guidance for folks on. Uh, on our AMD systems to not put empty USB-A expansion cards in those rear ports because it'll make the retimers not go fully to sleep and stay in a higher power state. And, that's, so, and then the retimers are not on those front ports. The front ports must not don't have that's the issue. Right. Yeah, so oh, the front right. right port has a different retimer that doesn't have that issue uh, that is not a USB 4 retimer. And then the front left um, as well does not have that that retimer. That's great. Well, I, I mean, I I love that. I, I mean, just just getting that transparency is such a breath of fresh air. Where okay. I mean, it's it, as opposed to being told that, like, I mean, I, or just not being told, frankly. Right. When, <laughs> and you know, here. you you would spend like years of your life being like, I think I finally figured out what's going on with my battery issue. Like, <laughs> my you if I plug something, anything into that USB A port, it will consume. Because I mean, battery life is a huge problem. I mean, among the many, many, many problems, I have this Dell piece of junk. Um, it it will the it will consume power when it should not be consuming power, um, and that must be. I mean, it's it's an right. added engineering challenge, I'm sure, in a laptop. Oh, for sure. Yeah, and this and it's not that like stuff like this is that uncommon. I mean, you're right that like if you look at pretty much any consumer electronics device, they're going to have these weird quirks just because of the inherent complexity of the things that we're building. But most of the time, you will see, you know, the thousand post forum thread or you know uh, you know ancient reddit topic where people are being gaslit into it, not knowing if there's a problem with their product the thing that is unique about us is that we will just go ahead in our community thread and if someone asks a question we'll go in and just answer like hey here's like the reason it behaves this way I Rob, as that. you were doing as you were doing bring up even uh, i saw you sending out emails to folks who are waiting in line for these devices explaining the state of that which I thought was amazing transparency along those lines and was very evocative of some of the same stuff that we were going through at Oxide about, you know, kind of following all of these, these problems with different parts of the system and so forth. Um, you know, I'd love to hear more about just the journey of, of bringing up 
some of these components and your and some of these new systems and working with some of your partners and vendors on navigating through some of these hairy issues. Yeah, definitely. And just on the on the openness, which I, yeah, I love about Oxide as well. It, it's this weird thing that I'm sure you've also seen that like, you know, in, in companies who've been in the past, the default was always, well, we, you know, we should be careful about what we're sharing. We don't want to, you know, send out something that might give people the wrong message or make people feel bad about the product or be afraid of partnering with us or be afraid of buying the thing. But in every instance in Framework, and I'm sure in Oxide as well, in every instance that you go out there and just actually be open and honest and transparent about a thing that's happening or a thing that's gone wrong or a decision that you've made, people receive it positively. Like they appreciate the transparency, they appreciate the understanding. And even more than just like that specific in instance of, of you sharing that, it builds long-term trust. People, people yeah. basically Amen. start to give you the benefit of the doubt. Amen. And that long-term trust, I think, is so important. And it's tragic to me how many companies don't seem to value it because I think that trust is everything. I mean, if you if, if you trust someone, you're willing to endure difficult times with them, you know, and you, you can hear that like, hey, you know, here's what's going on with the, the, you know, this is why this batch has been delayed. It's like, hey, I'm, I'm great. Thank you for letting me know. Like, here's what's going on exactly. Um, or, you know, here's what's, here's what the challenge we're having with your, and giving people that full context, um, right. I think is so important and so appreciated. It works. Everyone should do it. Highly recommend it. it yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there, there, there have been, uh, like a lot of, of bumps along the way. Actually, one question I definitely have, um, yeah. and sorry, Adam, I didn't mean to short circuit any question you might have around, uh, kind of navigating the ecosystem, but I am dying to ask about ddr5 because the, this is actually the first ddr5 machine i've i've had which is exciting um i i loved your transparency such as one can be transparent because it's a very opaque process in the part about like look it's going to take a couple of minutes to boot this for the first time um and it was interesting to, to read the community forums because we that's what we see with with our general base systems right. they take a long time to train was that at all a, to what degree was that a surprise? Uh, I, I love, again, you're kind of being as transparent as you can be um, with your own users about like, this is something you got to expect. It's only going to happen the first time. Presumably it's because you uh, will then encode uh, some starting parameters to really speed up training on, on subsequent boots, I assume. Yeah, that's just, uh, I mean, it's part of the platform behavior for both Intel and AMD on their, on their mobile processors. And, you know, normally for most, computers, you probably wouldn't ever see it happen because they're fully assembled out of the factory. They go through memory training and then they ship to you and you boot it and it boots like it would normally. The thing that's unique for us, of course, is that most of our customers are buying the DIY edition. And that means that memory and storage aren't installed and OS isn't preloaded. And so that installation process, the out-of-box process, you're putting in memory and so it has to train the first time around. And so we had to flag to people like, hey, this, this is going to take a bit longer and it's a bit unusual and this is uh, the reason that it's doing that. Yeah, well, again, very helpful and help with DDR5 is so, uh, it, it just takes a long time because it's very, it, what it's trying to do is very aggressive in, in many ways. Um, and um, so it was just kind of interesting to see that and, and fun to actually have DDR5 in my hot little hands in terms of uh, my own computer. So in terms of the uh, attacking into some of the open source firmware stuff, um, what has been your, your take on that? Because I know, I mean, the lowest level platform enablement, I think you, you probably have still had to use some vendor specific code, I would assume. Um, I know you got some inside. I think I've got an inside bias. Yeah, we on. use that's right. We use inside. Um, so our embedded controller is actually forked off of Google's Chromium EC embedded controller firmware, uh, which has actually been really great. Um, you know, a lot of uh, I think a lot of you know, notebook brands basically license embedded controller firmware, which there really isn't a, a strong reason to get proprietary embedded controller firmware. You know, there's nothing you know secret or magic in there. It's just good, solid, general purpose housekeeping. Uh, microcontroller firmware. And so we just took what Google developed, made it work with Windows. Obviously, you know, I'm trivializing it a bit, but made it work with Windows, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, <laughs> added the things that we needed for our own, um, and then kept on that. So we've done that with, you know, 11th gen, 12th gen, 13th gen Intel. We did it again with AMD. We're going to continue to use it in the future. Um, but for BIOS, there's quite a lot that's uh, 
uh, darker and more challenging, especially as it comes to doing uh, doing notebooks um, and yeah. you know supporting Windows and Linux. Uh, and so basically, like right from the start, we wanted to minimize the number of of miracles that we had to pull off to to ship a <laughs> consumer product, uh, especially one that's on fairly recent platforms. Uh, you know, for example, like 13th gen Intel and also the 7040 AMD that we just uh, started shipping were one of the earlier OEMs to actually be shipping either of those things. Um, and so for us, you know, really just taking take a step back and zooming out a little bit, when we ship our products, the most important thing for one of the most important things for us is making sure it's not a trade off to get the repairability and upgradability uh, and customization that, that, you know, we don't want someone to have to look at our product and think like, oh, yeah, that's really great. I love the repairability there. I want to get that product, but it's on last year's platform. I don't want to make that trade off. And so really critical for us was making sure that our products are performance competitive, form factor competitive, price competitive. And as much as, you know, we would love to be able to take, you know, right from the start, an extended period of time and a massive investment to try to get to open source, uh, you know, BIOS alternatives, uh, you know, core boot based or whatever else, uh, it would have meant we were shipping on, we were, you know, probably always going to be shipping on platforms that were old. Um, and that's right. not a trade-off yep. that we thought was the right one to make with our with our mission at the outset. Uh, that's not to say we won't get there. That's something that obviously we see that there is strong interest and demand for. We do want to get there. Uh, but for us, for now, the priority is making sure that we can ship competitive products earlier. It, totally. I think and I, I think it's the right trade-off because I think it is, uh, and you, you're right to uh, want to have the repairability on top of a competitive, a laptop that that one does not feel like they're having to give up things for the the repairability or the transparency, which I can tell you as a framework user, like you definitely don't feel like you're giving anything up. You feel like you've got like, I've got a laptop that is just better across the board and like, oh, and, and by the way, it's also repairable and it's not, and it's like, oh, great. Um, but that is, that's really terrific. You, you said that most of your customers do the DIY edition. Um, but is they there do. not a DIY edition? I actually, <laughs> I, I actually didn't realize that there was a somebody else's does, does it for you edition. Yeah, there there is actually a pre-built version. We call it pre-built. Uh, it's pre-assembled, has Windows 11 pre-installed. Basically, just ships the way a normal Windows laptop would. You take it out of the box and press the power button. There are people who buy that, um, and we understand why people would buy it, but the majority of our customers are going down the DIY path because, honestly, it's it's fun to build your own computer. It is, totally. and it's fun to actually yeah. like, see these components. Um, and I, I definitely have got new appreciation for the bezel. I'd like to say I have underappreciated <laughs> the delicacy of the bezel. Bezel, I will never underappreciate you ever again. That's right. Yeah. So the bezel is magnetic attached and color customizable. It was actually definitely one of the harder things to accomplish from a mechanical and industrial design standpoint. Um, but really, it started with this idea of how do we make the display easy to replace and not have it be something that you have to take, you know, a heat gun or heat pad and try to, you know, melt some adhesive to try to loosen a display and replace it, but actually make it something that you can just take some fasteners and unscrew them and swap out a display if in case you ever break yours or need to do an upgrade. Okay, that's interesting. So that this is an example where the repairability really was in tension with some other aspects of the system. Did that yeah, come yeah, up a so lot? Where like, okay, in order to make this thing repairable, we're gonna have to this other element gets more difficult. Um, yeah, well, that's the entire discipline of the system, I would say. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly, it, well, I, I guess just broadly, I think most people would be surprised, or actually, I think most designers and engineers, but also people who are not designers and engineers, would be surprised by how little we had to trade off to get get that repairability in. Because, you know, when, when you hear repairable laptop, I think, or customizable or modular laptop, the, the image that appears in your mind is something that's as, as thick as a phone book and, you know, looks crazy and has, like, stuff hanging off of it. Uh, and, of course, our products don't look like that. Um, but they are still extremely modular. And so it's really just thinking through pretty carefully the trade-offs that you're making and especially really thinking through the frequency of different types of repairs and thinking about, uh, you know, based on how often it is that you'll need to replace or upgrade a mainboard or a battery or a display, how much time is it reasonable to require a user to have to go through to, to do that, uh, that replacement? And so we really think about, like, making sure that the most frequent replacement items are pretty fast to replace, 
but then things that aren't that frequent, maybe we take some trade-offs where it takes you know 15 minutes instead of two minutes to replace. And by doing that, we can make it mechanically simpler or more robust. Interesting. And so naive question, what are the components that are, I mean, I know it's like, the, as far as I'm concerned, it's the battery and the T key, but um, in, in your experience, <laughs> what are the things that need to be uh, replaced earliest? Yeah, it's, I think in terms of like upgrade behavior, people doing memory and storage upgrades often ends up oh. being bring, uh, something that happens pretty readily. Obviously, for us, we have a, a large enthusiast base, a lot of people who are power users who always want latest and greatest performance. And so they're doing mainboard upgrades. But, you know, you're not upgrading your mainboard every month or every two months. You're upgrading it every you know two or three years. So if you have to spend 15 or 20 minutes doing that mainboard upgrade, that's a pretty reasonable trade-off for uh, for something that, that happens that infrequently. Um, yeah, I guess if we think about um, like the expansion cards, for example, if you have, you know, there's four slots on a framework laptop 13, but occasionally you might have other peripherals that you want to use and being able to swap those out pretty quickly without needing to pick up a tool or anything, that that's something that made sense to be a, you know, five second swap instead. Makes sense. And Adam, have you physically had a framework 16 in your hands? No. I, I, do it, they Are they out in the wild? Like do, do normal people have? Shipped- no, we haven't shipped them to customers yet. We're actually almost there. Uh, and we actually nice. just sent out an email last week where uh, we shared that we had started mainboard mass production, so started mainboard SMT. And we're on the path to shortly start full system FATP final assembly test pack out. Yes, it the is only a, it, it Adam, is a really I, cool I, box. It, yeah. Oh, it's a really cool box. It, yeah. Nirav, can you talk about the the GPU and, and how and like the integration there and Kind of oh, how yeah, you came up with those concepts? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the holy grail for gaming or really other high performance notebooks is the ability to upgrade graphics. You know, if you're a gamer or you're doing CAD or you're doing simulations, the thing that is constraining you mo- most of the time is going to be your GPU. And in desktops, of course, or workstations, you can do those upgrades. And it's maybe even the most common upgrade behavior if you're a gamer to upgrade a GPU in a desktop. But if you are buying that, fancy $2,000 gaming laptop in five years, it's going to be sad when you throw the latest games at it. Um, And so we looked at that and thought like, well, obviously if we're gonna build a high performance notebook that's aimed at gaming, like we did with uh, the framework laptop 16, of course, along with any other high performance use case, we better solve that problem. And so we looked at how everyone had solved it in the past. There've been several attempts, actually a few that ended in class action lawsuits because they didn't go so well. (laughs) Oh, well. <laughs> and, and, and thought, okay, how do we not end up with a class action lawsuit when we make our version of this? And it's always a good. <laughs> yeah, it's a good place to the... start when you're. <laughs> yeah. When you're starting yeah, a and product. how do we the... not get sued? And it, it, this is because the products ended up being defective because it was just too complicated. No, no, just to get they, right? they, uh, or... It was, uh, I think, I have to look into the details of it, but it's basically false advertising of claiming that uh, the product um, was going to be, have upgradable graphics and then there never being upgradable graphics. Interesting, yeah. Uh, and, so, and so for us, it was really looking at that and studying what went wrong. And the obvious problems were that the graphics cards followed a, you know, either the old school MXM format or custom formats where they were cards that were basically buried inside of the system, uh, mounted to the main board, buried inside. And so they're constrained in X, Y, and Z. They're constrained thermally, and they're constrained in terms of power, of course, based on the X, Y, Z envelope. And so when you know you design around that specific X, Y, Z and power and thermals, and then the next year NVIDIA comes along and you know a few months as NVIDIA tends to do before they launch something new, they finally share with you what it is that they're about to launch. And it turns out not to fit in that X, Y, Z, you are stuck and you get sued. And so for us, we looked at that like, well, we better make sure we design this in a way that we're not constrained. We're not constrained by anything that any of the GPU vendors are going to throw at us when they move generation to generation, even if it's just shifting stuff around, but also things like needing a little bit more X, Y, or needing a little bit more Z. And so what we did is we actually designed the back section of the framework laptop 16, basically the the, bod- the back of the base section, to be something that you can unscrew and slide out. And there's an inter- internal interposer that we can put uh, about a you know a little over 100 watts of power over along with uh, eight lane PCIe, and uh, basically because that module slides out, 
and is uh, is flush with the surface or exposed on the surface on the bottom and on the back of the computer, we can extend the depth of that module and we can extend the thickness of that module. And because it's also a module that slides out, we can basically decouple what happens inside of that thing with what happens inside of the rest of the laptop. And so we've given ourselves just an immense amount of design freedom to be able to make that expansion bay module and, or a graphics card that sits inside of it do whatever it needs to do as NVIDIA or AMD or others throw things at us in the future. That's awesome. And was that modularity helpful for development as well in terms of, of testing and validation? Um, not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it added quite a bit of complexity, actually, in part because we, we actually do use a different supplier for the main board and for the graphics card, uh, which is something that is pretty common, of course, in something like a desktop. It's not something you would ne normally ever have to deal with in a laptop. And so that's something that we had to navigate with our main ODM partner for the laptop and uh, the module maker for the graphics card, of course, along with AMD, who we partnered with on, uh, on the, uh, the CPU and GPU for the framework laptop 16. And could you, I mean, especially when you're talking about consumer quantities, um, I mean, could you talk, speak a little bit about the actual like physical manufacturing of this stuff and working with your RDM partner and how do you, I mean, and validation testing, how do you, how do you uh, th there's a lot of validation to try to pull off. Oh, absolutely. And the great thing about one of the, the nice simplifying things about what we're doing broadly as a company and framework is that we very deliberately go into mature product categories. And so for us, it's not that we have to treat an entire or teach an entire supply base how to build a laptop. They know how to build laptops. It's actually just teaching them the unique things about what our product is and, and what is different about ours versus the things they've built before. And so as we started to build the framework laptop the first time around in 2020, we really actually went to every top tier supplier for all of the big notebook brands and pitch them on this thing that we're building, uh, you know, both the, the final assembler, um, you know, main ODM partner, uh, but then also all the key modules like battery vendors and keyboard vendors and so on. Um, and so we're able to take, you know, pretty substantial shortcuts by being able to leverage all of their existing knowledge, uh, design knowledge, but also validation knowledge to build what ended up being just an 18-month process from starting the company in January 2020 to shipping the first units out the door in July of 2021. Of course, you know, That's during a, a pretty challenging period of time. As well. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is amazing that you were able to. And and it was that because you were able to kind of leverage what these these kind of X and how how much of those those designs are your own designs versus leveraging kind of extant ODM designs. Yeah, I mean the design itself technically is is entirely ours. Like the 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 tooling is all ours, the industrial design is all ours. Like we own all all of the design ultimately, but but it's still like that's kind of like an oversimplification where if you think about uh, you know the 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 schematic for uh, uh, modern x86 mainboard in a consumer product that's like a 100 page schematic and a lot right. of it is pretty much the same across every notebook. Um, and so, you know, having a partner who's built, you know, of 50 other notebooks that use the same platform, it means they, they know the tips and tricks to be able to make, you know, let's say 50 of those hundred pages go really quickly um, and be able to, you know, basically bring in that design knowledge, but then also the, the corresponding validation knowledge that goes along with that. So leveraging kind of their their own internal reference designs, or they're yeah, kind of, they're, they're able to permute des permute designs to, to kind of speed the, the development and validation. Yeah, that's right. And we work so Compal is our main manufacturing partner, uh, who we've actually used now for every notebook that we've built uh, built so far. And so you know, Intel and AMD have their own uh, you know customer validation boards, reference validation platform boards, and then Compal internally builds their own internal. Uh, reference boards or customer boards, and then basically we just take you know the next level down from that, which is building our own main board, leveraging the learnings off of both of those. Yeah, interesting. And then are you because the uh, so I, Adam, I actually saw I did see a framework sixteen in the flesh at the OSFC conference. The uh, engineer, yeah, and it's it, you're in for a treat. It was really good looking. It was it was yeah. fun to kind of and it was showing off some of the configurability of the keyboard and so on. 
Um, and he was based out of Shenzhen. So it, it, it sounds like you've got a lot of engineers actually in Shenzhen. Is that is that right? In, uh, in Taiwan. Yeah, no, so, yeah, so actually, Daniel, and uh, we've got about, let's see, about 18 people now. Oh, based in Taipei. In Taiwan. Yeah, in Taipei. Yeah, so oh, we actually have, uh, oh, okay. yeah, we've got two offices. We've got one here in San Francisco and one in Taipei. Actually, they're both. We were ju Just before you started, I think we were chatting about this, but in both locations, we've got the cheapest office in the most expensive neighborhood, which has worked out really nicely for us. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're in a cool neighborhood in Taipei and a cool neighborhood in San Francisco. Are, are we? Is that an Emeryville? Are we? Are we? Is, is that a? Uh, are we talking about Emeryville? Uh, there? Are we talking about the, the Oxide we, office? We are. are we, we are we, definitely we, the cheapest office in maybe not the most expensive neighborhood. <laughs> we are. Yeah, you know, I hadn't really thought of us that way, but we kind of are. Really. <laughs> yeah, we are. Hey, listen. I, 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 yeah, better. Hey, I was in an office that was the most expensive office in the worst neighborhood. Yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> that's, that's, right. that's, that's the opposite. You, you can go the, the the wrong way. Okay, so there is so it was a, at a time. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, and this, 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 no, no, and this was really, really critical for us. And actually, right. this is a I'm big saying. part of the reason we were able to ship in 18 months during you know global pandemic and lockdowns is that right from the start, we started building a team in Taiwan. And so uh, Nick, who's our lead industrial designer and head of industrial design, is uh, is based in Taiwan. And uh, he was the fifth person into the team. And that was just incredibly, incredibly important. And so we started building an industrial design and engineering team and part of our operations team in Taiwan, which is which is excellent because basically every manufacturer in every part of the notebook supply chain is headquartered in, you know, 20 kilometer radius from our, our office there. Um, and so, yeah. you know, no matter what we need, all the engineers are a short uh, metro ride away, basically. And the other really critical thing that we did very early on was we, we have the benefit of starting our infrastructure from scratch. You know, every electronics brand in the world, if they could start their infrastructure from scratch today, would build as much of it as they could outside of China. You know, we all saw that trade tensions right. were only going to get worse. Um, in 2020, of course, you know, they were already in a, in a pretty challenging spot. Uh, and so we looked at it and thought like, well, we better start our infrastructure in a place where we know we're going to not run into potential risks around, uh, around trade issues. And so we actually do, right from the beginning, we've done final assembly in Taiwan as well. And so the really convenient thing there is that our factory is uh, about an hour and a half drive or also about an hour by uh, high speed rail from our office. Uh, and so like engineers and operations folks can go from our office to the factory and go back within the same day, which is just incredibly useful. That is huge. Yeah, we have found that that same phenomenon in Rochester, Minnesota. So the, but the similarly kind of having that ecosystem of suppliers and the ability to get, I mean, boy, the ability to actually like walk the line and be on, on site in your manufacturing facility, boy, you really need it if you want to develop something correctly, let alone fast. Um, but you, you really need to have that physical presence. Absolutely. That's and, and the interesting foresight in terms of like realizing that like, Hey, the tensions with given kind of the trade tensions with China, and of course, the, uh, the all of our machines all start in Taiwan at TSMC. So, right. um, I mean, all of humanity has a dependency on on Taiwan right. manufacturing. So it makes sense to to just locate the the the, the whole kit and caboodle there. Yeah. And the um, other very specific yeah. and annoying thing for us as well is uh, Section three hundred one tariffs. So for folks who are not I, familiar, yeah. yeah, yeah, part of the trade tensions ways that the way that that's played out is a new set of tariffs on a pretty vast array of different types of products coming from China, importing into the US, uh, typically a 25% tariff. And there are exemptions on specific types of products. And one product that there is actually an exemption on is laptops. But unfortunately, there are not exemptions on basically any of the modules and components that go into a laptop. So actually, if we wanted to build the framework laptop in the US, it would be, and, and manufacture components in China, it would be substantially more expensive than just actually building a laptop in China. Um, but for uh, for us, it also meant that because the product's upgradable, you know, things like mainboard upgrades, we want to make sure we don't have to bake in a 25% tariff on the price of a mainboard upgrade. And so it's really critical to make sure that we're doing mainboard manufacturing outside of China. 
Interesting. Interesting. I mean, there's just so much to navigate when you are trying to make a physical product. I mean, there's so much that is complicated. But so again, in terms of financing, I mean, did you? Because uh, I mean, like Oxide, what you're doing is very idiosyncratic and yet very sensible. Um, <laughs> Did you, uh, and if you could excuse me prying for a moment, I mean, how did you, financing this is an effort like this is a real challenge. How'd you get it off the ground? Yeah, it's, it, as, as I'm sure there, there are folks in Oxide who are very familiar with it, it's not easy to fundraise for hardware. Uh, you, you built basically instantly by being a hardware company, you're filtering down the list of possible inven- investors substantially. And then for us also, we have the added challenge that we're a consumer. And so you yeah. have to take the intersection of people who are not afraid of consumer and people who are not afraid of hardware, which results in a, in a much smaller list of uh, possible <laughs> investors. And we did, we were able to bring in some really great investors from uh our seed round, we got in um, a couple of really great small uh, small funds, Pathbreaker, Anorak, and then a bunch of folks from the Oculus ecosystem. So basically the, the whole Oculus founding team. Um, and then uh, we were able to bring in Spark for our Series A. And Spark is great. Spark actually also invested in, uh, in Oculus or relatively early on, uh, but they are one of these great uh, venture capital f- firms that's not afraid of consumer or hardware or consumer hardware so that's great so that's interesting that you're because you're tapping i mean oculus the i mean from a venture perspective the most important thing about oculus is it made everyone a lot of money um right. so it's a it, it's kind of a, a it's a contrarian play that had a big outcome and so i mean that's helpful to be able to kind of tack into that i mean that's kind of the same because the way you describe it as like yeah we're taking the intersection of a consumer products and hardware it's like yeah, that's an empty intersection. You don't have <laughs> a to, to be able to point to a big outcome. And the thing I, I think I'm sure you felt that frustrating as well. I mean, it's great that you've got that the immediacy of that Oculus outcome. And kudos to the Oculus founders for for you know helping kind of the next generation of startups and their former colleagues in terms of of starting their their things. Um, but God, it is frustrating because uh, you know so many of the most valuable things that we have built are a combination of hardware and software, and and yet you find again and again and again you find venture firms that simply do not want any hardware component whatsoever. It's like, oh, okay, Absolutely. so you would not fund Nvidia, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't fund AMD, you wouldn't fund Tesla, SpaceX. Like you just say nope on all that. Like, okay, yeah, I get it. So you right. want to fund like Groupon and Foursquare? Awesome. Um, yeah, and one of the sorry. big challenges with this is that if you look at uh, you know the portfolios of a lot of these of a lot of these firms, you'll see that there was some single high profile consumer hardware failure where totally. someone stuck their neck out and decided like, okay, this Juicero thing sounds great. We're we're going to go all in, <laughs> and then a couple of years later, sorry to anyone who worked at Juicero, nothing against you personally, uh, but uh, but you did ruin consumer hardware for everyone. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, but it, it is that. And then they look then think like, okay, we're never trying this again. This is that was it. We're one and done. Um, but really though, it is you need to see companies like Oxide and companies like Framework, and hopefully many others out there go and succeed and, you know, get traction and, and gain growth uh, to actually make these categories credible for investors again. Yeah. And I think, again, I mean, kudos to the Oculus folks. I just, I think that is so important to be kind of paying that forward and, and knowing it's like, no, you actually, not only can you do interesting things at this junction, but you can develop uniquely valuable things. And then things that like, Honestly, like have a deep moat. I mean, I love that you and I mean you like oxide. You've got the comfort of being totally transparent because it's not like someone is going to look at the design of your expander ports and be like, "Aha, I can go start a laptop company." It's like, yeah, it's a little harder than that. It's a term. Right. Sure. Or if Dell wants to embrace that, go go for it. I'm go sure. Go for it. Please. Love that. <laughs> right. Yeah. The key thing for us, like, it looks like the thing that we're doing is building these like really innovative, novel products. But actually, like fundamentally, the novelty in framework is actually the business model. So like the, the thing that, that we hope people knock off more than anything is, is actually the business model, but it's the thing that's the hardest to knock off. And the business model really all, at the end of the day is about aligning incentives around longevity that, you know, a product lasting a long time is good for the end user and actually good for us as a business. 
Yeah, that that's really interesting in terms of that of the longevity of the relationship as a business model. Uh, and yeah, and how do you get people to kind of replicate that? How do you get people to, to to see the power of that? Because I mean, do you get resistance from folks being like, "Well, wait a minute, if you make this framework thing easy to repair, someone won't have to buy a new one from you every eighteen months." And you're like, "No, no, no, that's that's a good thing. That means I'm making a robust product, and I can go find more customers for this thing." Right. Yeah. In general, like you know, obviously our customers like totally get it, and I think consumers and uh, you know journalists, tech press, they get it. Like they they see the pain points, they understand why it's important, why this makes sense. Um, and, you know, even investors, I think like the ones who are not afraid of consumer hardware look at this and think like, yeah, this feels inevitable. And when something is inevitable, you better get in on it early rather than late. Um, even, even suppliers, I think the same thing plays out that like, you know, in theory, if we, if we succeed, when we succeed, um, we're going to shrink the size of certain categories. Uh, but for suppliers looking at that, they can see that, well, if, uh, you know, if it fails, it fails. But if it succeeds, we better get in on this thing early and make sure that we're the ones building that other, you know, rather than being late to it. Well, and I think, I mean, this is, this is classic innovators dilemma and a disrupting innovation where it's like, yeah, this is why the existing players are not going to do this and why this, I mean, and I guess I should ask you as a question. I mean, did you, when you had this idea for what you wanted to go do, was it always going to be a startup or did you contemplate like, can I get this to happen inside of the existing players? Or was it always just clear that like, no, this has to be new company formation? No, it was, yeah, it was clear that it needed to be a startup from the beginning. And it's really, it's really, yeah, it's it's the counter positioning of the business model. You know, if you're an executive at, a, at I'm not going to pick a name, I'll say just any electronics maker, and you go to your board and say, hey, we've got this new strategy, we're going to cut our unit sales and revenues in half over the next five years, the board's <laughs> going to find another another CEO. Yeah. Um, but obviously for us, we can do that. We can start from zero. It's all growth. We're just capturing more of the pie, even if the pie is getting smaller as we do that. Totally. Yeah, and I when I, th I think it is, it, it, it is very hard to take a, a company that's built on the wrong way of doing it or a way of doing it that, that you're trying to obviate and trying to actually modernize it's just excruciatingly difficult. And I, I mean, certainly we came to the same conclusion that like, now this is, there's a bunch of reasons why this necessitates new company formation and why the existing players just simply aren't going to do it. Uh, and also, I mean, I think that, I mean, I'm not sure you, you were obviously at Facebook or, and or Oculus it's like when you're in a large company, you're also, there's a lot of, you're not having to raise money, great, but you are having to do a bunch of other things that are a huge waste of time. You're having to, right. to fight rival organizations and everything else. So there's a lot of, as challenging as it is to be a startup, there are also a lot of reasons to do it that way. Right. Yeah. And in, in Facebook, building the framework laptop would have been 18 months of strategy discussions and then <laughs> another maybe, you know, two years to build the product. Totally. And, and then so, I mean, obviously, in terms of the future, you've got the, the, the Framework 16, it, and I, is the, the, the target demographic for that, I assume, is, is, is you're really getting into the, the laptop power user. I mean, Adam is the target demographic. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we're getting a little bit broader. That's right. And it's that's really how we think about generally how we think about our roadmap. We think about it in terms of expansion, both in categories and in audiences. And obviously those two things go together. So we build products that solve more problems for more people. And we continue to add on to that set of problems that we're solving with each one. And so with the framework laptop 16, a big one was gamers would love to be able to upgrade graphics. People who do heavy CAD workloads would love to be able to upgrade their graphics and they can't today. So let's go and try to solve that. Interesting. So that it really focused on that upgradability being a real differentiator for those right. in, in, in those markets. Yeah, that was that was the key. And then the other one was uh, kind of going back to like solving these obvious problems, like with the expansion cards, everyone's got different ports, everyone needs a different set of uh, peripherals that they plug in. For our framework laptop 16, we looked at uh, your big screen laptops, basically, and we found that people were making decisions oftentimes based on whether or not a numpad was present on this, you know, $2,000 machine, this, you know, 
$15 item <laughs> dictating a $2,000 <laughs> purchase felt, felt a little weird. And so we thought, well, okay, why don't we just let people choose the input that they actually want to have? And so similar to expansion cards, we built this input module system that lets you reconfigure input, uh, which then also brings us back to this idea of community development, where we're never going to be able to build every type of input device that anyone in the world could want. And you know, if we look at people's desks, we see their desks are covered in this like vast array of different devices that are pretty personal to them. And so by opening input in a laptop up as something that is this customizable surface, so we open an ecosystem around, we get to bring in the entire creativity of the community to bring all of that uniqueness and personalization into the laptop itself. And you know, if you talk about the, the community and, and some of their creativity, I've seen some folks like building custom cases for the boards that you're making and oh, yeah. kind of building, uh, you know, Nintendo Switch like devices. Are, are, have there been examples that you've seen from the community that were surprising or particularly delightful? Oh, yeah. Probably the most shocking thing that we've seen is a Braille laptop. And this was uh, oh, wow. this is actually a small company oh, called Orbit Research. Um, they're based in Massachusetts, uh, but they've been making uh, these Braille input and output devices for quite a while, actually. But they've never been able to make a standalone entire computer that is just a Braille laptop effectively. And so they were able to take the main board and build it into this Braille device. And we were we actually got a demo of it. They they shipped us one to test out, and it was just this like mind blowing experience to to you know know that there's a framework laptop mainboard inside of that thing and powered on and see the 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 braille lettering start to activate. Wow, and that I mean that's what what a I mean it's a, it's a terrific feeling just in general to unlock the creativity of other people it feels great. I mean there's something I, I don't know it's like uniquely human about it of where we that we truly the sum is greater than the parts but to be able to do unlock someone's creativity that that is unlocking for for a third party is i mean potentially life-changing for them um Absolutely. to be able that is really amazing i don't know if you've listened to um matt campbell who's a a, a regular listener and and contributor to oxide and friends we had a great discussion with with him i got I don't was that. How many how many years ago was that? I mean, that was um, back in the uh, in the Twitter Spaces era. In so the Twitter Spaces a year, era. year and a half, two years ago, yeah. Yeah, which means you only have to suffer through about like fifteen minutes at the beginning of the episode where we figure out the audio. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's a theme. It, it is definitely a theme. I you know, I gotta say, like Discord, you know, whatever we are now, a year plus in, Discord has got very few audio issues. All all told. It's pretty been great. Um, but I mean I can just imagine that the and I, if if you didn't didn't catch this one, I and Ravi was really talking about also the segue to it was actually uh, about the Play Doh system and how um, how that just opened up whole oh, new yeah. vistas for people back in the day, and it's really neat that you can kind of unlock this ethos where people don't have to just accept these computing devices as kind of falling falling from space. They can actually right. understand how they work. They can actually augment them. They can buy something else from a third party that does something that's neat or interesting or valuable or life-changing i mean i think it's just that's extraordinary yeah and, I, and we're still really only well, i guess less than two and a half years in from shipping the first product and so these are still mostly new laptops that are circulating that people are still using as their their primary computer and i think some of the really interesting and creative stuff is going to start to happen as those things age even further and you know someone picks one up off of a um you know uh, out of a drawer that, that's not being used because it's a decade old, but all the documentation's out there, and so they can do anything they want with it. Yeah, that's uh, th that'll be great. And so, I guess you know, so far, what what have been some of your big surprises? I guess I mean, you've had a, a, a clear vision for what you wanted to go, the, the part of the market that you wanted to go serve, and um, speaking as part of that market, it feels pretty great. <laughs> um, but it, I'm sure there've been some surprises along the way. Oh, for sure. There have been surprises. Uh, one of the pleasant surprises, I would say, is like in a few different open source and specifically like Linux communities, we've we've kind of ended up becoming almost a default. Like if someone like asks in a in a specific community around a specific Linux system, like, hey, which which laptop should I pick up? What's got good support? That the answer will just, you know, oftentimes rapidly be, hey, you should get a framework laptop. We've you know tested it on every generation. It works smoothly. The laptop's great. 
Um, and, you know, becoming the default is just this very, very, very powerful place to land at. Um, and something that we want to try to do for more communities, we can figure out basically how to solve that community's problems. Well, so actually that helps to answer a question that came up in the chat. Um, support uh, any plans to support FreeBSD in terms of, of um, another alternative operating system? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Uh, so we don't like do any, anything officially around it, but we have seen a lot of folks in the FreeBSD community using uh, using framework laptops. We've seen a few good write-ups. Um, and so, yeah, at some point in the future, that's something where maybe we would do a do our own write-up with just some condensed instructions around it. Although I think you'll also find that for, uh, you know, I think I'm sure, I'm sure both, both of you are very familiar with, you'll find that in some of these communities, the, the more, uh, like, hoops you have to jump through and like the more obscure you know, the setup process is the more the more enjoyable it is to specific communities <laughs> Maybe we, we don't want to make it too easy uh you know i feel attacked um the, <laughs> um well actually i was actually saying that the, the, so there was an era so i mean of course we, I, I used to run solaris and open solaris on, on laptops adam and i both did and there was a a tremendous value and i still feel this way about just running Linux, running Ubuntu on a laptop, it's like I really, it is so valuable to know that other people in the community are using this thing. Like just right. getting a, it, I mean, there's a, there it, it is an enormous kind of economy of scale of getting the software because like I need to know that I'm not going to be alone trying to get this thing working. And we yeah. all were running that the the same laptop, this Acer Ferrari branded laptop. And Adam, do you still have your Ferrari? Still have it, still running bits compiled out of my home directory that were the prototype uh, yeah. for D-Trace on uh, AMD 64. Fast Trap X, baby. I think, that, right. I think that Fast Trap X being the name of your, what we now call a, a branch, but was, mm. uh, what do we, we call it? It was the, the, the teamwork, the, the teamwork rather, the... Um, the gate, your fr your framework, yeah. uh, your fast trap X gate. But I, you know, I think my Ferrari might be running fast trap X. I still have mine too. <laughs> the last operating system we ever installed on this. It was the last operating system we ever installed. But I mean, listen, if we're gonna get FreeBSD working on the framework, it may be time. To dream <laughs> the dream, Alumos on the <laughs> framework. You heard it here first. <laughs> sure, why not? Love the dreams it. alive. I mean, many reasons why not. But sure. I mean, many reasons why not. Only some of them good. Um, <laughs> that's right. The but I actually think that, that I mean you have I mean so much of that is actually so much of that is having the just having the hardware stay still long enough to get driver right. support mm -hmm. and and then having the transparency about like what is the actual like what what is the Wi-Fi neck what is the what is the neck what you know what, what, are the, are these various elements that don't tend to stand still. And don't and people aren't transparent about, it. and so it's really hard for it's hard. I mean, what you realize is like it's also hard, by the way, for it's even hard for Windows to keep up with some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, there's there is enormous value in getting a, a, a kind of a, a reference that we can all, and especially, I mean, Rob, then it, that the point that you made early on becomes really important of your dedication to like, no, no we are going to be also going to make this thing high performing, and we're going to hit the right price point, and we're going to hit some of these other things around around repairability and around transparency and it's i mean that's it's a lot of constraints on the problem um but boy the payoff is huge if you can get there for sure yeah and the other thing for us is that you know we try to document as much as possible but if we fail to document something and someone's trying to develop you know a kernel driver or you know user space utility whatever else like they can just post in our community and someone's going to show up and answer them that's pretty great. Yeah. So, so where should people go for um for kind of next? Obviously, I'm I, I I would imagine that you got at least some number of listeners that are configuring their framework framework thirteen or sixteen <laughs> right now. But um, where should people go to kind of learn more about framework and the the community and so on? Frame dot work. We actually picked up the domain name before figuring out what the company was going to be, but it is frame dot work. Do you have someone? Do you have a framework.com that's trying to sell itself to you over and over again the way we do we, the oxide.com? <laughs> we do, unfortunately. I'm sure the, the story is the same in, in every scenario, but it's some delusional individual who's got you know too many zeros at the end of the number. <laughs> <laughs> Way too many zeros at the end of the number. And so, in like, we approached the oxide.com owner and we're like, I'm thinking, like, I don't know, I pay like, I don't know, 10,000 bucks for it. And they're like, yeah, the the we work with a broker who's like I'm able to get a real deal on this thing for like 420k. <laughs> you're, you're lucky that you have a broker. Ours is uh, is an individual who doesn't who doesn't even want to go the broker path. 
Oh, the, the, he doesn't want to get the broken friend. It is like, and they almost like, hey, sorry, oxide.com. We're oxide.computer, and I don't care about oxide.com. Oxide.com can go jump in a lake. And <laughs> hey, less, owner, you know. owner of framework.com, get Ben. It's frame, frame.work. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, I, um, it's, well, good, good on you, frame.work. And um, yeah, I think you're gonna, I know we've got a lot of uh, simpatico between our two companies for sure, and a lot of, of shared ideas about what the what the future of computing should look like. And really, it, it is about empowering the people who are using computers. And that is what computers that was the. And I think you look at every big revolution in computing, and it was empowering for people. It was empowering for users, and it was empowering for the people who would develop, uh, who would uh, harness their own creativity. And uh, I feel, and you must feel too, that we 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 lost that for the last couple of years here in for both the the, the client side and the server side. So um, let's get it back. Right. You know, the, the interesting thing about that is like we point back at success cases and like actually looking at Oculus, that was one of the success cases that we started by empowering developers. So we made sure that we you know very deliberately and carefully positioned it as a dev kit, knowing that consumers were going to buy it. But most importantly, uh, you know, if you thought like 18 months for a framework launching our first product was fast, we, you know, in, in Oculus, we shipped the first dev kit in like six months and then oh God, the second wow. dev kit in a year after that. So it was really like the first few years of Oculus were almost entirely focused on developer enablement. And, and, you know, as you said, like it really, really is important to get developers bought in and enable and empower them. Yeah, that, um, well, I, and that, that's that's what it's about, and it's about empowering the people that are actually using this stuff. So, um, I, I what's uh, I, I'm super excited to have my my framework laptop, and I know that we're gonna. Um, I I would like to believe there's a framework laptop user out there that can't wait to have a rack full of oxide. So you know, have to, <laughs> <laughs> you can do a bundle sure. bundle deal. You know what I want to do? Actually, we need to do like a framework oxide. We need to do like an oxide edition, like an oxide bezel or whatever. Yeah. That we do is like yeah, a giveaway, like buy a rack and you get a get a free framework thirteen or sixteen. Yeah, we can come up, we can come up with a yeah a one U uh, module that's got expansion card slots or something. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm happy to give away the laptop. We don't have to. So, we could, um, but, that's right. All USB A across the front. All yeah. USB A exactly. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Well, Nirav, thank you so much for for joining us, and uh, it's, we're we're huge fans. Um, and we should uh, you you have to come back again. We can compare notes on uh, the, the hardware software journey, um, and uh, I think inspire the next generation the way we ourselves have been inspired. So, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's great to chat. All right, thanks everybody. Take care. Talk to you next time.